today, on the occasion of the publication of Francio Guadalupe's new book, as you can see over there, a Black Man in the Netherlands and Afro Antillean Anthropology. Um, we have various scholars this evening uh, studying Dutch realities of racism and uh, the afterlife of colonialism, conviviality, and urban popular culture to join François Guadeloupe in a conversation. Uh, but before we, we get there, um, I would like also to uh, say welcome to everybody at home who is not present and uh, who is watching. Uh, and of course, welcome to you all here in uh, SPU 25. I am very happy to see you uh, face to face and uh, happy in the situation of the pandemic uh, that we can sit here and talk to each other and talk about very interesting things like Francio's book the, this evening. So what do we have uh, for you today? First, uh, we will start with Keisha Smith. Um, you heard some music. Uh, that was uh, her music that she uh, DJs. Am I right saying that? Yes, thank you. Keisha is a Rotterdam-based DJ. She's sitting over there, a program maker and a host. And she completed her studies in cultural anthropology. And um, she will start and she will talk about urban popular culture um, because she wrote an article about that. And what is very interesting is that in Francio's book, you also read a lot about urban popular culture. So it's very important. Um, we also have, after Kisha, Alex van Stipriaan. He is Professor Emeritus Caribbean History and Culture at the Erasmus University. Welcome. Um, after Alex, you will hear Amade Amshark. She is a professor of anthropology of science at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Amsterdam. And her research interests are in forensic, forensics, forensic anthropology and race. And she's sitting over there next to Flancio. And then last but not least, Guno Jones. He is an interdisciplinary researcher at the Vrije Universiteit. And his main research interests uh, are on the nexus between European citizenship and migration regimes, intimacies and constructions of European identity. And of course, we have Francio uh, Guadalupe, who is also a researcher at the University of Amsterdam, uh, if I am right, also the KITLV, Koninklijk Instituut voor Onderzoek in de Tropen. No? Okay, got that wrong. <laughs> what is it? It's Koninklijk Instituut, Royal Institute. Language, Volkenkunde. Southeast, Southeast Asian Caribbean Studies. Thank you. I am. Uh, I speak English, but my uh, first uh, language is uh, Moroccan Temazigh, Berber, and then Dutch. So, <laughs> thank you for the help. <laughs> so, I. Um, you will also have uh, an opportunity to uh, ask questions. First, we will let our very interesting and very welcome scholars. Uh, ha uh, tell us about their reaction about Francio's book. And then after that, we will have a short musical intermezzo of five minutes. And after that, you will have the opportunity as the audience to ask your questions. You can fire your questions towards Francio or our other esteemed scholars that are here with us today. Um, there will be a Q&A of a half an hour. After that, the evening ends and there will be drinks. So if you want to hang out with us, uh, you can hang out with us and have some drinks. And also we have uh, special cards that we will disperse during the evening, during the musical intermezzo, which has a QR code on it, which you can scan and reserve Francio's book, which you really want to have after hearing all the interesting things that will be said this evening. So, Kisha, I would like to welcome you on the stage. Could you please tell us more about urban popular culture and the article that you wrote? Please give her a warm applause. 
Um, okay, so uh, this wasn't this wasn't really I wasn't really prepared, so I'm just gonna talk about my experience in all of this. Uh, so I studied anthropology in uh, Utrecht like a couple of years ago, maybe ten years already now, and I did a master in sociology. And during my studies, I just actually I always wanted to DJ, so I just um, did a course and I DJed. So during my studies, I just had a uh, part-time job as DJ it was really uh, was really cool and then I started to host a party in Rotterdam so I host a party together with a friend of mine we host a, a hip-hop party together and after my studies I started working as a as like market researcher and I was really more the commercial side of the anthropology not really the um, how do you say it, the cultural side of it so I started at the um, at a research center and then I I actually um, rolled in the music industry so I worked at Sony Music before, and then at, and then at Top Notch and Noah's Ark for a couple of years as a researcher. So there I just really engaged with uh, like the urban Dutch culture, um, pop culture music. So yeah, what, what, <laughs> what should I tell? What do you want to know? I mean, it's really my piece in the in the in the previous book of um, Francio is about like the Rotterdam urban pop culture. And he asked me to write a piece about it. And what I really noticed during my time at Top Notch is that the like the, the young artists like with roots in Suriname or uh, the Dutch Antille or like the Caribbean side or West African side, they didn't really talk about like the real serious stuff like colonialism or like slavery, that kind of stuff. But they just really have like really fun, uh, popular club music. But they like pay a ode to their roots with um, with true language, to the sounds they they um, um, how they make their music with the sounds of the Caribbean or the West African sound. So it's really that way. They I wrote a piece about how language is really taking over in the Dutch language, like especially Surinamese language, and how that is like a sign that. Um, it's not really that they that they like are dealing with their history in that way, but it's like a, a form of how they um, express themselves and try to incorporate their roots in like the Dutch culture. So, if you kind of understand what I'm saying, what well, that's like, uh, what I wrote. <laughs> so that's what I wrote, and yeah. So now I'm working as a program maker in the World Museum. So I did go back to my anthropology side of of. Um, my past, and um, we're doing actually an uh, exposition about hip hop culture, but actually through the lens of how they made up space in how hip hop communities um, created Rotterdam, like sort of kind of how they created the city. So we're working on that now, and yeah, that's a little bit of my uh, my history and what I did. You have any questions or? <laughs> Thank Hello. Thank you for uh, sharing. And uh, I was just wondering, what were your findings about? Because um, it sounds very interesting. So, your my findings about like the piece I wrote, how or they, how, yeah, how they uh, reinvented or invented the Rotterdam. Um, no, like we just we're really into the creative uh, uh, process of the exp exposition. So it's we asked like five um, makers in the city to uh, express their vision about how communities in Rotterdam created the city. So we're, we're like in the pro in the creative process of the whole exhibition. So I'm, I'm going to be surprised with what, with, with, with what they bring because I don't really do the research. I just do the program around it. But it's it's kind of interesting how like certain streets or certain um, like, um, how do you say it? Um, Buurthuizen. Uh, community communities centers, centers really played a big role for like young uh, musicians young artists so that's the history we're going to talk about from Rotterdam perspective thank you Keisha Smith give her a big round of applause <laughs> thank you I would like to uh, ask Alex von Stepnian to uh, come to the front and uh, big big uh, round of applause for Alex uh, he will give a reaction about Francio's book. Let me just stand here. And then uh, we will not have any questions afterwards because that is what we will do at the end. 
Good evening, dear friends. Am I audible in the back? Yeah? All right. Dear friends, dear Francio, congratulations. 1968, James Brown released a record in the USA, which became a sort of unofficial anthem of the black power movement. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. 2022, Francio Guadeloupe releases a book, Black Man in the Netherlands, but which actually, to my opinion, should have been titled, Say It Loud, I Am, and I'm Proud. That is what I suddenly realized uh, after having read the, the book. Francio's book is, in my eyes, the next step in what that other iconical song of those days promised, A Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. You all know it probably. And then another realization struck me after having read the book. You can follow the money, but we should at least also follow the music. Because there is a lot of music in this book. Or to put it differently, Political economic analysis is absolutely necessary, but maybe more important, or at least on equal footing, is an urban popular culture analysis of society. Music and musicians as signifiers and agents of change. In the introduction of the book, Freccio explains what his main questions are. In my paraphrasing, that is one. How do I and many who look like me survive and thrive in the Netherlands despite racism? First question. Second question. How to analyze my existence? The perspective is Francio's, of course. How to analyze my existence without falling into the trap of reducing reality to a white versus black conceptual frame? Third how to combat anti-black racism in an alternative way. Alternative meaning other than the dominant black activist intellectual approach. And maybe the last question is less obvious than the, two, the first two. So if I understand Francio correctly, he looks for other analyses than the dominant black activist intellectuals do because he thinks them too essentialistic, too exclusivist, and too political or, say, top-down in a way of being blind for what is really happening on the ground, which is a multicultural, inclusive, urban ground in constant motion. Part of that dominant discourse, too, is the position that appropriation by others of everything black by non-black is bad. For Francio, it seems almost the other way around. Appropriation is good, as long as it is a form of sharing, not at the cost of someone, of course. And this brings him to define black in a much broader way than only those who have roots in sub-Sahara Africa. He also refuses to be um, the embodiment of the black victim, the black outsider, the colonized angry Antillian man, the black nationalist, or what have you. In his own words, I quote, I choose to see it as a political act, to imagine myself as an agent, actively integrating with multiple others, and therewith co-constructing the ever-changing open collective called Dutch society, end of quote. And that is something completely different from the reality in the USA, despite the recognition that there is a blatant and structural racism in both societies. Part of the difference is that Francio found uh, in the Netherlands, or maybe even he found the Netherlands in general, an extension or actually a post-colonial remake of the intercultural hotspotch, hotspotch and interaction and creolization he was used to in the Caribbean island where he was born. The Netherlands as a creolizing Caribbean island, island. That's an interesting approach. And creolization as a form of fair and mutual appropriation 
as an instrument or rather a way of life to combat anti-black racism. That is alternative indeed. At the end of the book, Francho says it, says it loud and clear. We should all become urban black so that black ceases to be a problem or a curse or however one experiences it. Somewhere, Francio, you write, we are all pluralities, pluralities. And I would add to this that those pluralities are all in different stages of development. But that is not a fundamental obstacle as long as there is motion. And as long as we are open to being multiculturally parented by significant others. People like Francio's grandmother in Aruba or Oma Bea, Grandma Bea in Rotterdam, who helped, who both helped to raise youngsters, who show directions and who are themselves living examples despite many in, inner contradictions. And while encountering in this book more than 35 examples and quotes from the famous CLR James, it became very obvious to me that in an intellectual way, Cyril James parented Francio too. And I will uh, uh, substantiate that with a present. I will show it to you. I made it specially for today for you. CLR James, in his younger year. Well, that, well okay, okay, okay. <laughs> That's for James. So, um, now I would like to finish my praise for your work by adding that unavoidably you left me alone uh, also with a lot of questions and comments. For example, is history only a burden or is it also uh, a, a dimension of time to think through and maybe even be parented by the future, for the future? So is it a burden or can it help us for the future as well? Or what do you want me to see when you refer to people who look like you? Or how widespread or how deep are the multicultural dimensions of urban culture in the Netherlands from a bird's eye view flying over the Netherlands to Zeist and Tietjerstradeel? Is that the same kind of uh, uh, um, multicultural uh, urban culture, etc., etc.? So there's a lot of lot to talk about, and that's that's uh, uh, um, another praise to your book. Finally. Maybe to some, um, it is no recommendation whatsoever that a senior, white, heterosexual man praises your book. <laughs> Which to them, by definition, cannot be okay. Well, so be it. <laughs> to me, your book came as a welcome surprise. Um, after I recently presented at my university my farewell lecture, which was titled The Creolization of a White Historian. Coming from maybe almost opposite positions, there are a lot of parallels in the path we both chose. And we both seem to find it enlightening to analyze our positions and personal developments to understand where society may be heading for. Therefore, I have one final request, uh, Francio. Wait another 20 years or so, and then please, please write part two, the sequel to this book. Because I want to know, to know how Clyde and Jarzinho and Naima and Jutmar and Kuhn and Sven Elias, uh, Seven Alias and Bruder Liefde and most of all, how you have developed in making this an all-inclusive society. In conclusion, I cannot and will not define your book as the opposite of Afro-pessimism, that is, as an example of Afro-optimism, because that would still be too exclusivist. I think you ha just have started a new approach, which I would define as Guadeloupean humanism. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. And thank you, Alex, for already giving so much away about the book that is so important because I want to dive into something else. Francio, how does it feel? How does it feel to be the author of this mesmerizing book? How does it feel to, be, to have succeeded at bringing so many voices, so many lives and worlds and the harmonies and frictions between them into paper? How does it feel to have produced a symphony about life in post-colonial times? Yeah. Well, I, for one, was constantly moved reading your words. Occasionally, I had to cry. Okay, my body has been taken over by some viruses last week, <laughs> turning me into a zacht eitje. <laughs> Admittedly, <laughs> I, I read your book in a delirium. <laughs> but I think it was mostly because of your beautiful prose. I was moved by the beauty of life that is contained in your stories. First, I thought, stop, Mesharik. This is nostalgia, you know? I thought, uh, I was thinking about, you know, you are rem reminding me of times that passed by when I was living in Haarlem and Schalkwijk, where, you know, the art of living well was the art of crisscrossing cultures, tasting each other's culture, and indeed teasing each other, borrowing and drawing boundaries. We moved in and out of each other's lives, across cultural backgrounds, across age differences, almost self-evidently. Almost. Your book attends to the very everyday work of maintenance, the maintenance that is needed for nurturing life, for making coviviality happen among your group of friends, in the neighborhoods, in the work that beard mothers do, such as Oma Bea, she was mentioned, Jufrau Annette, and many uh, others more. And you, as an anthropologist, contributed to that as well, th that work of maintenance, beyond those instances that you describe here, by going back to Oma Bea to have conversations about Black Pete, by keeping contact to all the, and the fingers, finger on the pulse, with the many young people that you have encountered in your research over the years, simply because you're genu genuinely interested in them. And with James, you urge us to go and see beyond general categories, to attend and care for what is happening in specific contexts and specific settings. But you also put us to the test by intervening in our modes of viewing, intervening in our vision, First, you do away with our idea of center and margin, where the Netherlands is the center and the Caribbean islands are at a nice distance. You undo this by making the Netherlands, and it was mentioned already, into a Caribbean island. One that can learn from the other islands about the self-evidence of difference, not as something to, to be overcome, a problem, but something that is part of life as we know it. And when you open up our modes of seeing things to sound and music, you make seeing into something that is about listening and dancing. Music, so I hear you, is not something that the collective plays. Music plays us. Music makes the collectives. And then your most intriguing lesson based on this, given that your inspiration is in, indeed by... Our, um, uh, you're inspired by urban culture where music is the thing. If we want to move beyond racist, exclusionary society, if we want to do conviviality, we should take note of urban culture, a culture where differences do not get fixated, where there is humor, there are fights, violence, love, and the rest of it, and that keeps permuting the kind of boundaries that we tend to build. You offer life, time as life, as an important entry into a problem. And I'm really grateful for this. Because we are surrounded by death, violence, and racism, um, and it is crucial to attend to these. But they, they might also create biases in us, biases that make us zoom in on antagonisms, on the differences in opinions, social positions, colors, and what have you. Life, as, you, as an entry point, might invite us to open up and take notice of the many more relations that are there, but they're not so loud as others. So, lots of praise, and I could say so much more, but I do want to raise two questions for the conversation. 
And one of the concerns that I have and that I really have would like to talk to you about um, later on much more deeply um, is about the danger that your book might be read as happy diversity. So how to prevent this innovative approach to be read as happy diversity? And I mean, there's nothing wrong with happy diversity. Then if so, if we want to do happy diversity, what is needed to make that happen? And my second question, which is also a question that I would like to talk to you about much longer, um, has to do with differences. Your fieldwork examples, if I can call them that, they're not examples actually, they became kin to me, are full of statements about differences. Culture, nationality, color, class, gender, neighborhood, a multitude of differences. And articulating and pointing them out is important to you and to your narratives. So why then, I kept wondering, do you not theorize this multitude rather than constantly adding this other layer of pink and brown-skinned people? And I must say that I was really put off by that, read in the context of your stories as they, it was there. So how can we not read this in relation to those intricate stories as something else than race doing and race making? So that's a hard one, but it's uh, one of my worries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your reflection, Ahmad and Shadek. I would like to ask uh, Guno, who is already walking towards the stage, Guno Jones. Big applause for Guno Jones. Thank you. Yeah, it's always um, a challenge to uh, be the last person to address uh, Francio and, and to address uh, such a wonderful book. And I think a, a very a very layered book that uh, really requires a lot of thinking and a lot of uh, continued conversation. Um, Black Man in the Netherlands is an excellent and deeply engaged anthropology of urban life in the Netherlands. It is uh, both uh, radically empirical and, and deeply theoretical. And uh, it, is an, it is an exploration of, of, of questions of race, identity and justice in the Dutch context. And uh, the book uh, reads, and it has already been mentioned, as a criti critical response to an unproblematic and decontextualized adoption of US centrism regarding politics of race and justice by actors in the Netherlands. Uh, you take issue with a, re with a recurring, a haunting question that is posed by critical race uh, theory scholars, especially from the US. How does it feel to be a black man living in the Netherlands? And you explain right from the beginning uh, with your poem and also in your introduction that this is a very problematic question because of the assumptions that are in there. And you say, uh, I quote, for the critical race theory scholars, the world that colonialism built is inherently white supremacist and anti-black. It cannot be reformed in any shape or form. Even every black man or woman in the West lives in a society that is, that is de facto against them. And, and you, you, you continue, I find the critique powerful, yet too totalizing and too sanitized in its reduction of life. And this is, uh, this is indeed, um, and, and you find that question very annoying. Um, because it supposes that you have to inclus exclusively embody the role of, as you say, it, ra a racial, the racially hurt outsider in the Dutch world. Why can I not just be an Afro-Antillian man going about the business of doing life, whereby racism is one of the major ills I must also successfully contend with? Uh, and, and throughout the book, you deconstruct the assumptions that are inherent in this question based on your lived experiences in urban spaces in the Dutch kingdom. And by centralizing urban popular col culture and conviviality, you question both the primacy of former politics and the idea that racism is an immutable monolithic phenomena. And while you take racism uh, seriously, you dedicate a chapter in your book to how, it, how you dealt with anti-black racism. 
understandings of Dutch social reality should not be limited to the impact of former politics and the structure of racism on the lives of people, but should be complemented by an approach that gives central attention to the formative role of popular culture and social life in urban spaces. So your approach, and you're very uh, explicit about that, is, uh, is based on the premises of cultural studies. And you build on the scholarship of people like Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy uh, in the British uh, context. So what you demonstrate is that people are constantly transcending ethnic and racial boundaries in everyday life in a variety of urban settings. And these connections may substantially impact uh, their, their everyday lives and their, um, well, their living conditions. So it's also very material. It's not, it's not only about symbolics. Um, and, and you utilize the work of uh, Caribbean scholar Glissant, who conceptualized it, has already been mentioned, uh, creolization as the fundamental relationality of our existence, eh, of our social lives. And, uh, and the Netherlands is, in that sense, indeed, a, a Caribbean island. Um, however, you also point to the fact that uh, urban culture is complex in its political meanings. So it is the terrain, indeed, of conviviality, but it's also the terrain of, uh, you know, multifold contradictions and subject positions. And sometimes people involved in these processes aim for a more just society, and in other cases their ambitions are in line with global capitalism and uh, existing hierarchies. So um, rich people, for, for instance, you say rich people are not exclusively pink-skinned anymore. Uh, they, they, there are also mel melanated individuals who live comfortable lives. Hence, you argue, uh, if I understand you correctly, that we have to rethink our politics and our classifications. And you say, I categorize wealthy black, blacks like JC or Ofra Winfrey as white, while pink-skinned Poles who migrate to the Netherlands to work for next to nothing are best described as black. In the last part of the book, you explain that there is a fine line between combating racism and repeating uh, racialized racial logics in a politics of recognition. And you especially uh, take issue with black essentialist and Afrocentric centric conceptions of political blackness. What you, what, do you, what you refer to as the North Americanization of race among Afro-Dutch in the Netherlands, among some black intellectuals in the Netherlands. And I... <laughs> I understand your point, but I think that um, there are also complexities within these, um, you know, politics of recognition, and that uh, part of the work that is done by them is also inspired by a Caribbean intellectuals such as Anton de Com, who was very uh, broad and, and, you know, humanist in his approach to, to, to reality. Okay, but um, so. Yeah, you, you, you take issue with the notion of emancipation that entails that equal recognition, recognition of these primordial identities, with each getting a fair share of the national or global economic pie, is that that is the way to go. Uh, because uh, you say uh, such an approach would remain within the logics of a racialized worldview. In essence, you argue for the relevance of political blackness as a politics that speaks to, to the predicaments of a variety of oppressed and op exploited. Non-racialism should be the rule rather than uh, the exception. And you are inspired by the spiritual universal universality of the Rastif Rastafari. And I really like that. Um, the Rastafari I and the I concept is uh, about the idea that uh, in within every human there is the seed of divinity. And um, yeah, so that is very nice. And I will end with a question on this. What is, according to you, the relationship between a spiritual notion of the human, uh, of the idea of humans as seed of the divine, 
and non-racialism is a non-material definition of what it means to be a human, a condition of possibility, or perhaps a necessary condition for a peaceful, non-racial, and non-hierarchical coexistence of all humans on planet Earth. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone who's online and all the people who came out. Uh, and let me thank Kadisha, let me thank Kisha, and let me thank uh, Alex and Huno and Amada for their, um, uh, their very powerful reflections uh, on the book. Let me make eight points about the book. Um, and then I think afterwards we can have a Q&A about it. Um, the book, how did the book emerge? The book emerged because I met many people who were studying critical race studies, and they would ask me a question, which was ironically the same question that W.E.B. Du Bois was constantly asked, which he writes about in his Souls of Black Folk, that people would meet him and they wouldn't even want to see him. The question would always be something like, how does it feel to be a problem? And he refused to answer that question. And I found it, found it ironic that in, what was it 2013, 14, 15, et cetera, that I would meet critical race scholars from the US who would ask the same question. It was a strange irony to me that that question was asked. So I felt it was important to write a book to say that is not the question one should ask. I'm going to tell you how life is in the Netherlands, but I'm going to try and show concepts which are different uh, and ways of living that, 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 that show something else. So when Alex nicely put, the question, put it that um, James Brown wonderfully said, uh, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud in the uh, 1960s, which was the anthem of the civil rights movement, I thought, you know, I was singing Peter Tosh. I am that I am. So indeed, I am that I am. And, and, and the song is wonderful because he says, I'm not here to live up to your expectations. Neither are you here to live up to mine. What we have to do is find a way to, to deal with one another without these categories. I am that I am. Came out around the same time. It was a different kind of anthem, um, pushing for a different kind of, uh, of conversation. So. What does that mean, uh, generally speaking? And this is point number two. And what is the politics about it? Which is an interesting question. I think Huno posed it nicely. And to me, the question is to say, we owe something to the blackened peoples of the globe. And the blackened peoples are all those people who actually work so that we can live comfortable lives. All those people who were enslaved, indentured, et cetera, et cetera. Those people are our ancestors. We owe them something. So how we act has to be in a way that actually reconstructs the world so that you will not have people who are blackened continuously. That is what it's about. So when I say becoming black, I mean starting to recognize your ancestors. Therefore, anti-black racism, as I explain it in the book, is about people who became black around the 1600s, people of sub-Saharan descent, sub-Saharan African descent, who had many different cultures, as I read in someone like Marise Conde of Guadeloupe, who said they were many different people, they had many different cultures, and if you think people only see these uh, modern racial categories, then you don't recognize that that's not what they were seeing. They were seeing a bozo, they were seeing a pearl, they were seeing uh, et cetera, et cetera. They became black, because becoming black meant, now I'm going to treat you as an object. But that's anti-black racism. But global anti-blackness must include people from the Aborigines in Australia. It must include the people of Papua. It must include the Rohingya. It must include what happened to the Amazigh. It must be broad. It must include the, people, the Dalits and the fight of Ambedkar. It must include all of that. So therefore, all these people are our ancestors. And therefore, part of Marx was correct, that the people who are in a social relation of, of, um, 
uh, of down pression, they have to find a way of uniting, and we owe them. That's what the book uh, argues. That's why I say becoming black in that sense. Um, now, there is two other questions which is, which is interesting. The question of uh, happy diversity vis-a-vis -vis conviviality. Um, I think what, it, what I aim to show was that, generally speak, speaking, people find a way of getting along. That's what they do in this society. They might not always like one another, but they find a way of, of just moving the thing along. And if you want to build a politics, you will have to build a politics on what is taking place. You can't build a politics on imagination and the imaginary story. You have to build it on what people are doing. So there are people in the book who I really loved, like Naima and, and, and Saba, who I grew up with, who are here. We lived together. They didn't care that I didn't follow Islam. We were good. We have to find a way of understanding that so that we can build politics based upon that. Um, Norman, who I followed for years, who did lots of work trying to push certain types of ideas in, uh, with a radio station in uh, Amsterdam Southeast, the Belmer. He did not care whether the person was from India or the person was from Eastern Europe or they were from Suriname. Once they were busy with the positiveness of society, there he was interested in them. That is the basis to me of the politics that we need to push. And if we keep promoting a kind of idea that, that and Amada said it nicely, and perhaps uh, we have to talk because perhaps I'm making a mistake, that differences are all over, but differences are constantly differentiating themselves. They must, because that's just simply what life is about. Um, I said I was going to do eight points. I think I have made about five, but let me just do number six. And the kind of politics that one would then need to push is, and this is important, there's nothing wrong with a politics of fulfillment, a politics of many um, activists in the Netherlands who use an American vocabulary to say, we want our rights. We want the liberal state to live up to its uh, promises. There's nothing wrong with that. That's an important thing. And one should push that. And you see a lot has, has, has um, uh, transpired because of that. But next to the politics of fulfillment, you need a politics of transfiguration, a politics in which everyone is moving and changing continuously. We don't know where we're going to end up, but that politics means there's no outsider in this. It's the politics, for instance, that I saw on salsa and bachata parties. Everyone is dancing, everyone is moving. They're transfiguring continuously with one another. And it isn't, because I thought I was suave and cool <laughs> in those parties, that if you can't dance, maybe they'll dance with you the first time. <laughs> but the second time, they're going to think, uh-uh, <laughs> you've got to learn this thing to be part of the thing. That's a politics of transfiguration, in which it isn't about how you look, it's about how you learn to move in this, this thing, this thing that we're creating together, the musicking, as you nicely uh, uh, put it. Um, now, seven. There are many people that I need to thank for this book, and one of them is Dustin, and he is here somewhere because he really, uh, helped me with this book. He was there throughout. Uh, Dustin is a, is a student who I don't consider a student because he's very smart. Uh, not that all students aren't smart, but he's... <laughs> mind you, that was a... a, a <laughs> but he's someone who I could um, um, uh, um, spar with about these things because he was into the urban. Keisha is into the urban. Manu, who's not here. So many of the... Oh, Manu is here. There we go. Uh, many of the... Um, the persons I met who were part of this, uh, who were studying anthropology and who were into hip hop or into Rastafari, and they were mixing these things, mixing the theories with what they learned uh, musically. 
Peter van Rode, who was my colleague sitting opposite to me when I was writing this book, and probably I annoyed the hell out of him because constantly I had an idea, and then we would talk and have deep conversations about this. Jordi, who was then a PhD student, we were hashing out, discussing these things. My wife, uh, <laughs> who who probably got tired of me constantly <laughs> writing and writing, and I was saying, this is the last book. <laughs> and, she was, <laughs> and she would say, hmm, <laughs> this is really the last book? And I would say, yeah, no, this is the last monograph. <laughs> um, but there's an edited volume coming out. Uh, <laughs> And there's one with Alex coming out, um, but it will, be, it will be it will be the last um, uh, book. And and uh, and of course my kids who who really were there for me, and all those persons that were part of this book, and the persons who I grew up with. Um, I wish that Mike and Dragana and these others would have made it to come here to be part of this celebration because it is a celebration of them. We often look at the heroes that are in the media or are standing on the barricades, but we forget all those people who actually are making this society continuously more just. And they are not the ones who get, um, uh, who get a, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, are on the billboards or so forth. But we have to give respect to them. Some of them are here, like uh, Stasha Fari. Uh, they are doing that work, and we have to respect that. And lastly, I dedicated this book to Peter Hushira. He's somewhere here because, um, uh, because he was my supervisor many years ago, but we became good friends. And because I saw that he actually, without having too much talk about it, was doing the work doing the anti-racist work. And I thought you have to dedicate a book to someone who does that work. So that's it. Thank you. Those are the eight points. So, is everybody okay? Are you all right? Yes? Okay, that sounds more like it. I am going to sit like this. I'm sorry that I have to sit with my back towards you. I'm going to try to put this a little bit over here. Thank you very much, yes, please, for taking place here. It's a big honor for me because, uh, yeah, it's uh, really interesting to see all the people that Foncio always brings together, and uh, not to say the least. Uh, and we're going to start with the Q&A. So it was very interesting what you all had to say in your reflections. Uh, I heard a few questions, and of course, Francio didn't leave any room to keep them <laughs> just out there and answered some. But one of the first questions I heard was from you, Amada, about, um, let me just uh, get it here, the happy diversity question. Uh, would you like to say something about Francio's reply? <laughs> yeah. No, is also an answer. No, I, I mean, I, uh, I was actually quite satisfied with the answer that you gave, and um, but I do think also the reason why I asked. So, so what, uh, what does it need to facilitate that kind of happiness? <laughs> I mean, it sounds really nice. I'm not that kind of thinking along those nice lines, actually, because I think the world is in a bad state. But what we have seen happening is precisely the, you know, the budget cuts, uh, the deterioration of neighborhoods, so the facilities that you described. This is why I felt like, you know, this is nostalgia that I'm feeling. Uh, the things that were so self-evident that could happen in neighborhoods because there was space, there were possibilities, are no longer there. So uh, maybe it's a, you know, downward <laughs> economic question, <laughs> political economic question. But... Um, so if we want to do this, if we want to facilitate this, um, there, is a pol there are political consequences. I guess that was the, the nature of the, uh, the question. I agree fully. I, I think that, well, I agree. We have to. Oh, you have to. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. We do have to uh, safeguard the gains of the welfare state. That is a vital consequence because those things have made it possible for many people to, to 
come together, but also people to rise and climb. So I think that is uh, one of the political issues, uh, and issues that we all have to stand for 100%. Yeah, I agree with that fully. Yeah. That's good. When people agree, then <laughs> we can go on. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to be actually more explicit because I think it's, it's, we are in a dangerous place in situations where, um, as, as you say, you know, people tend to live together, interact with each other in, you know, in, in good faith or bad faith, whatever. But in the situation that we are in, where uh, the schroef is <laughs> aangedraaid, um, other political... Um, um, uh, powers <laughs> emerge, right, where uh, the possibility of interacting is simply cut off and you get enemies and uh, friends and foes and you get all these uh, difficult things that are too difficult to resolve. This is, yeah. Could, could I add to that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, linking up to that, uh, um, to the happy, happy diversity uh, uh, perspective, um, Two observations. One, when I was riding on my bike to this place, I rode through the pipe and all these terraces with heating, etc. All white. All white. No interaction uh, between anyone, affluent young people, etc. Um, there are other places in the pipe as well which are all black or mixed. The, our, ideal situation. That's for one. A second observation is I think it is very crucial to, let's call it native Dutch culture, to avoid others, not to interact. As long as you don't bother me, I won't bother you. That's very much part of, of this culture. So how, how can you change that, attack that? Uh, uh, uh. How does it fit into your uh, um, concept? That's a good question. Um, and I'm going to answer it by saying that I don't know about the pipe, <laughs> so I can't answer about the pipe. I, I, I was not biking there, so I, I, can't, I, I can't answer that. Um, I think that this society is so diverse, and for me diversity, and I, sh I should answer that also, because happy diversity is, I don't know what that is, that's probably a, a management tool or something like that. Um, diversity for me means uh, invitation to entertain, critically entertain difference. That's what diversity means. So diversity is not a set of different categories. I, I, I don't know, that is, perhaps that's happy, perhaps that's, uh, that um, uh, management style diversity. But diversity is simply for me that. Uh, and that is what people have to do if they, if they live together. Now, I don't know about a monolith called native Dutch culture. I don't, um, I don't know what that is. I know that there are many um, There might be regularities, but there are so many differentiations here in the Netherlands that I, um, I think it's an analytical mistake to actually create to, maybe it's an analytical tool to say there's two different things. So I'm going to look at the native Dutch and I'm going to look at the other Dutch. But I think we have passed that stage. I think we now need other analytical tools to understand what is going on and some of the things that are going on are indeed problematic um, political parties that are recruiting people. But when I look at certain neighborhoods, when these political parties recruit people, they are recruiting also that multiplicity is somewhere in it. So um, let me give an example, perhaps a concrete example. Uh, and I think it was when it was the last uh, municipal um, um, elections and I went to Rotterdam and I thought you know this is terrible because the, the forum had won in the, and uh, so I'm talking to some of these youngsters and one said you know my mother voted for um, Leif but I said but how and he said you know she doesn't mean anything but she just has it difficult 
So she voted for Leif Bar. And then I met people who were of uh, some people of Surinamese descent and other descent. They also voted Leif Bar. So that meant for me that Leif Bar has a Leif Bar is a, is a is a populist, conservative, authoritarian, uh, with racist inclinations party from, from Rotterdam. Um, it meant to me that I thought, you know, but I'm looking at it from outside and I'm saying, how can you vote for this? But somehow, internally, people find ways to still vote for this. And that means we need to do work to understand that. But if we simply say native and those, then we don't understand what's going on. We need to really be in there to understand why people make choices that I personally think is not in their interest in the long run. But they make those choices. But is there also a difference, as for example, what Alex said, that you have this individualistic idea of uh, culture in the Netherlands? I think, um, I think many middle class people have the sense of, I don't want to be bothered. And then I'm saying many middle class people. They just don't want to be bothered. Um, but I think one of the things they have to be bothered with is making sure that you do um, have facilities, public facilities, where people can meet, that there's investments in that. Making sure there are possibilities if people choose for social assent. Uh, making sure there are all kinds of um, procedures to to take care of for different forms of, uh, um, of dehumanization and, and discrimination, racism, and, and, and sexism, and all the other kinds of Thank uh, you. negativities. Let me yeah. ask, you know, do you want to reply on that? Or do you want something to add to that? Uh, well, no, I'm, I'm um, actually, actually I, I, I don't have anything to add at this moment. Uh, I, I had a question, but that is um, uh, that that I think that will require a very long conversation, and that is, <laughs> and that is the question about um, the universalist inclusive idea you seem to articulate in your book uh, around citizenship, and that citizenship is somehow a category that guarantees certain inalienable protections. That's a long um, conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's a long conversation. And you know. <laughs> in, in, informed by, by by my own, um, you know, uh, research, yeah. I see a lot of racialized instabilities of citizenship. Correct. If you think, for instance, about the, you know, discouragement policies towards, your racialized discouragement policies towards Eurasian fifties. <laughs> The Bosman Bill uh, that was aimed at uh, Dutch, yeah. at at at, at um, kind of like limiting uh, limiting free mov movement of Dutch citizens from the uh, from the main islands in the Caribbean to the Netherlands. So that, that there have been a lot of um, expressions of conditional citizenship, of racialized conditional citizenship, both with regard to movement and mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, proposals. Um, and, and also within Dutch society, if you, for instance, think about the, the, the Toeslag affair. So, um, yeah, that's my question. Eh? What, what is, um, yeah, sometimes I have a sense that you naturalize the, the meaning of um, a formal legal membership. And, and I think it's, it's, yeah, I constantly... Uh, feel as though that is very unsafe, that status? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good question. Look, I, nothing in me believes that civil and political and social economic rights are forever guaranteed. You have to fight for those. You have to keep actually saying it's important that we struggle for these things. Uh, let me give a, 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 a short example. A, a, a separate example. <laughs> I, for instance, um, 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 for all kinds of vaccinations and so forth. But I did have a problem with people actually trying to trample certain people's civil and political rights in having to say, well, I don't want it. And then I think, even though I might disagree with them, but those civil and political rights are so important and they can easily slip away that I think then I'm going to stand with you. I disagree with you as far as whether you take it or not. 
but those rights are yours and people have fought for centuries to get them and now that we have them we have to keep them the social economic rights which is one of the expressions is, is the welfare state we have to keep those can we agree that there is also a difference between the interaction between the individuals and the greater um, society effects regarding to certain laws, certain policies, etc., which are not playing out between individuals, but are from a bigger and uh, maybe individuals cannot have an effect on them, as you would think, because like Guno also gave the uh, example of the Toeslagen schandaal. Yeah, you um, should explain that. So there, there, um, you should explain it correctly. You should explain it. So there, the, the Dutch state um, or the, the Dutch, uh, what's the last thing? Um, tax office um, uh, hampered thousands of Dutch persons, many of them Dutch persons who have an uh, immigrant background. And it started because there was somehow a claim that happened with, I think, Bulgarians or people well, of Eastern Europe. There was a whole history changed. regarding so that. I yeah. think. I think that's an issue of bureaucracy and the danger of hard bureaucratic things. And of course, there too you have to intervene. Um, I don't know if that's exactly the same thing as civil and political and socioeconomic rights. I think bureaucracies, yeah, okay. I, 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 you need to take the microphone. Uh, yeah, and then I, after I, this, we will yes. go to the Let audience. Yeah. I, I think it, it was partly uh, an issue of bureaucracy, but it was also a very racialized response. Uh, in a sense that uh, people with dual citizenship were were, were the targets, but also there was also um, um, one of the, the um, uh, 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 there was also discrimination based on uh, on 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 um, the name of people, uh, the, the, the the names. So uh, a foreign sounding names were also uh, targeted, targeted. Mm -hmm. and and. Um, and I think even even um, phenotype played a role in the ways in which the the tax office conducted these these policies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, um, I'm not saying that 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 that's kind of like um, yeah. And and I um, yeah I, I wonder how um, systemic these forms of uh, conditional citizenship are racialized conditional Let's citizenship. Let's. Uh, yeah, wrap this up because yeah. otherwise we'll talk <laughs> all know. evening about the yeah, Dutch tax and the uh, so there's a lot to say about it and it has a very long history and uh, of course it's interesting but what's most interesting is of course Francia's book and the speakers that we have I here on stage <laughs> and <laughs> last but not least you as an audience so I would like to just leave this discussion here and go to the audience we have uh, a colleague of mine is standing over there who has a microphone. So if you want to ask something, raise your hand, say your name, and ask your question. Please don't make it a whole paragraph. Try to keep it short and to the point. So who has a question? I see Francio is, I see, I see somebody there. over here. here. Can you run towards her? All right. <laughs> Oh, now I'm behind the pole. Hi, thank you for an interesting conversation. My name is Eliza. Um, I've obviously not read the book, so this question is out of context. But um, talking about political blackness, I was thinking about how what you were presenting, or at least in the conversation, is presented as something that we needed to move towards again, a kind of blackness that embody, em em embraces class and basically oppressed people. And I was thinking about how this isn't new, right? When we were um, in Haiti, the revolution there kind of had a definition of blackness. In Britain in the 70s, there was a political blackness that was more expansive. I would like to know two things. How do we pivot? How have we pivoted back to what is the reason that we are now in a much smaller understanding of what it means to be black? And if we can understand that, then how do we then extend past it to a blackness that allows for everyone's liberation, right? In the same way that feminism should be interested in the liberation of people who don't have vulvas too. Thanks. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant question, Eliza. Um, the, the Haitian case, the Haitian constitution is discussed in the book of 1805, whereby the Haitians said everyone here is black, whether they're of Polish descent, German descent, everyone here is black. Black is the category of being against uh, injustice. 
then you're a citizen. That's a particular kind of reasoning of citizenship. Um, it was conditional too, much conditional upon you actually fighting against injustice. But we uh, should just add that you also have uh, in your book, there is a difference between black with a capital B yeah. and black with a, with a, small, with a, yeah. a small B. Yeah. Um, political blackness as it came to the UK uh, and it also had some, some resonances in, in the Netherlands. That came indeed in the 60s with, with uh, where people of Bangladeshi, uh, West African, Caribbean, and, and, and Pakistani, and Indian descent, they were all uh, uh, part of it, and sometimes even included Irish persons in this, in this political blackness. Part of that was also inspired by what was happening in Trinidad, uh, in which people of Afro and Indo descent were joining together, and many of these people were, had, had links with one another. I think one of the things that happened is uh, what was called here in the Netherlands minderheid um, beleid, um, minority, and then it said, I'm going to give you money as Antillians. I'm going to give you money as Turkish people. In the UK, something similar happened. And then suddenly the coalitions that you had were not tied to state funding. So if you had a coalitional party, then it was more difficult to get things done. That happened. Uh, so <laughs> that, uh, and it happened also here. It happened in the UK and so forth. Now, I think that what is called narrow, narrower definitions are not narrow per se. So if someone tries to bring together people of uh, afro Surinamese, uh, um, certain persons of, of Antillian descent, Cap Verdeans, other places of um, people from West African descent, and they call themselves black, that's not a natural category to me. That's also political blackness. It's just one expression of political blackness. And the other one was also another one. If people can recognize that what they're doing is a political black identity, then it becomes possible to open it up. If people think it's an essential something, then they don't recognize there's nothing essential in it. It's just simply because together we're going to unite and therefore we call ourselves this. Mm. Otherwise, I call myself an Antillian, <laughs> and that's fine too. Yeah. Thank you. Also. Yeah. Thank you for the great question. I saw somebody uh, with their hands up over there. The, um, yeah, to, yeah. Um, oh, OK, thank you. Uh, I, of course, didn't have the privilege and the honor to read your book yet, but I am looking forward to it. Um, there was, you said about the politics of fulfillment, and there is something, um, actually, you have to go beyond that and have transfiguration. And, and the quote of yours, got to learn to move to be the part of it. But I was wondering, how does that transcend to the opposition, where, where I, in my experience and in my observations there is opposition could they learn and to move from it and how do we go and how would we make sure that they also learn to dance for example because yeah that was my simple question thank you good question so is that question for Francio of course right? yes okay. look a politics of, of, of fulfillment is a politics of liberalism um, which is the politics of safeguarding the rights that we now enjoy. Therefore, I'm saying it's important that politics has to be done. But that politics is necessarily based uh, or has the possibility of exclusions, and it constantly has to be bolstered, and it can be racialized, and so forth, the things that Huna was talking about. So therefore, next to that, you need a politics that is busy really radically reconfiguring the society, um, whereby at its best, um, in many uh, Caribbean societies, with all their, West Indian societies, I should say, with all their, their um, um, agonisms and struggles, there is no face that doesn't look like them. Everyone fits in there. 
we are moving to that here. That transfiguration has to happen, in which when you think a Dutch person is anybody. It can be anybody. That tra and that's why I said, perhaps we have to think it as becoming more Caribbean. And therefore, I not refuse to, to, to speak about uh, the victimization of, of people of Antillean descent and, and, and otherwise. But I think perhaps we now need to see what they are doing to transform the society. Just like we looked in the Caribbean, that these, uh, they were not even societies, <laughs> not even countries. They were factories and businesses. People made factories and businesses, they made them countries. So we started to look at what people were doing. And therefore, I think that's also of consequence here. Not only what happened to people, but what are they doing to transform it with other people? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? At the back of the room? Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, Francio. Uh, unfortunately, I did not also read your book. And, uh, <laughs> I think I already found out today that there was a book. <laughs> and, but I have a question about the um, political blackness and anti-blackness. And I think, in a way, my question is sort of double fold because I know political blackness from the UK, and it really included everyone who was oppressed or who was marginalized. And um, it included black people of African descent and Asian people, Bangladeshi people, and Asian people from also from Uganda and the rest of Africa, until Asians started to progress in society, and then political blackness just went away. And I do understand the concept of political blackness right now, which is a very, I would, something I would call a very Marxist perspective in a way, argumentative. Um, but also, how do you deal with anti-black racism within this political blackness? Because what usually happens is that even within a group of marginalized people, a group where we're all calling ourselves black politically, there are people who are fiercely discriminatory and discriminate against black people of sub-Saharan um, heritage. One, how did you unpack that in your book? And secondly, no, I forgot my question. Good question. <laughs> secondly, how do you deal with this idea of divide and conquer that is used as a tool by the dominant class? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that, this, the second question is, is what I try to answer in certain state-based um, uh, policies at particular times that, that divided uh, persons. And I think that if these things come on the table again, we have to say no uh, to it. And I see it sometimes coming on the table now. And I think whenever one group is invited, everyone comes in. We have to be able to say that. Because then it, it, it starts to matter. Now, on the, the question of, um, in the book, I, I argue for the, the logics within people that are the logics of the conquistador and the nativo. And, and I mean by that what Franz Fanon meant. That the anti-black or the anti, uh, the, yeah, the anti-black is within everyone. So Fanon would argue that it's also within people of sub-Saharan African descent. So we have to work through it. And I think some of the best was working through it. Two of the, uh, I, I was inspired also by C.L.R. James with people like Anton Alahar and Lyndon Lewis and so forth, Caribbean Marxists, they're still alive. Their notion was, we have to work through it. Yes, there are all these issues between people of Indian descent and African descent and Syrian descent, and we have our, but we have to work through them. Not because we have them means we have to be separated. We all have to do decolonial work on ourselves. There's no one group that's fully outside of the work of decoloniality. That is what I learned from Anton Alahar and, and uh, Lyndon Lewis and, and Ramarsan and, and, and these others. Um, it's what I learned from James as well. So um, I, I like that Alex gave me this thing of James, and I think James should be read more, because James would say the liberal rights that we struggle for happened because of the French American and Haitian revolution, those three revolutions influencing each other and pushing each other further. So I think that is important. James's notion of uh, his rework of Moby Dick, his importance of popular culture, which I learned from him uh, through reading Beyond the Boundary. 
in which he's saying that culture is doing something with people. It's teaching them something. It's having them work together. So next to Dubois, I think many people should start reading James because they were writing at the same time, but James had a different take on the matter. Writing about the Hungarian Revolution as well. So he never stopped. He never said, this is not my thing. He could write about the Hungarian Revolution. He could write about the Polish Prehistorica, and he could write about the Haitian Revolution and the Ghanaian Revolution. Because he said, I'm an intellectual. Why are you boxing me in? Thank you, Florencio. Thank you for the interesting question. Um, just to add to that and then going to the next uh, question in the audience, uh, the inner work that different communities that are fighting against oppression must do. Uh, for example, what was said, uh, internal discrimination, uh, colorism, etc. Do you think also sexism and uh, anti... That's also like all decolonizing. That. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. So yeah. there's this intersectionality yeah. that happens. And all, I think I, we, we, we all have work to do on, on ourselves and, and, and sexism and all these things. I mean, I, 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 I'm not free of, of, of many things. I need to work on myself continuously as well. Um, intersectionality is, is a different something. Um, Intersectionality is an important uh, conceptual tool that was used. I like more the concept of articulations um, because intersectionality has the, sometimes the, the tendency to be additive. This and that and that and that. Whilst I think no, um, these things are constantly troubling each other and you need articulations. Political blackness as it's now happening with people who call themselves Afropean, that's an articulated uh, identity. It's putting things together. Um, uh, and I think that's, so I'm, I'm more for a, a, a politics of articulation. And perhaps I should explain it this way. I think at a particular time, there was a set of theorists, and some of them are still there, like Anton Alahar, Lyndon Lewis in the Caribbean, and people like uh, Gilroy and Stuart Hall. They were arguing for something like hybridity or sometimes, I think they call it creolization sometimes, which we contained many things. Regardless of how you looked, you contained many things, so you had to work on yourself. The politics of intersectionality is that you are one thing plus that, plus that, plus that. So which means you're black and a woman and uh, perhaps hetero or, or gay, whilst the politics of creolization was I'm black with European tendencies, I perhaps like, uh, I love Islam and so forth. I'm that hybrid thing, and I need to work on myself. Which and that's where articulation plays a role. And intersectionality is your one thing plus that thing plus that thing. Thank you. Yeah. We'll go to a question from the audience, the gentleman to the pillar. Yeah. Peter. Peter. Uh, I am Peter van Rode. I have read the book twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to ask a question about this difference you make between a politics of fulfillment and a politics of transfiguration. Yeah. And I actually wonder if there is something like a politics of transfiguration. And you look, <coughs> it's a great thing of your book, you look at the dance floor and you see the future. There are people mixing, making life. The social miracle is happening. And people can do that quite well by themselves. It's, that's one of the reasons your book makes the reader so cheerful. It actually offers hope. Mm -hmm. And you read it and you think, yes, that is happening. And you can perhaps say with Amade, and the state has perhaps a role to play in facilitating this, but basically, we don't need the politics of transfiguration. And the people are doing this at the moment. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. overwhelming thing you argue. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I would say. Okay. And mm -hmm. the second thing I would want to say is that you say, well, this politics of fulfillment. And there is a, there's an awful lecture of Himmler, the head of the SS. <laughs> The head of the SS in 1941 or so. Uh -huh. And then he invited the chief officers 
and he tells them, comrades, ideologically, we have won the battle. All opinion polls show that all Germans consider Jewry the greatest enemy of Germany. But there is still one problem. Every German has a Jewish friend. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know how well integrated the Jews were in Weimar Germany. Yeah. There have never been that many intermarriages between Jews and Gentiles. It did not make a difference at all. Uh, politics of fulfillment, as you call them, mm -hmm. is all. Mm -hmm. That is what politics is about. Mm -hmm. That's a good, a good question and a good comment. Um, because you, what you're saying is the politics of transfiguration is not politics. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I would say it's politics on a lower frequency, <laughs> using Paul Gilroy's point. So it's not politics that necessarily needs the state. Um, uh, but the state can play a role. And then the state in, in municipal forms and so forth, or state apparatus types of things. Where I think, and, 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 and I can see where a defense of the, the, the liberal democratic order with, with those rights is vital, and I think it has to continue. But the question for me is, is this state is a state which causes the vast majority of humanity no good. So therefore, we do need something else to transcend that, because it's not so like the rest of the world is living wonderfully whilst in certain parts of the globe, liberal democratic rights are, are, are vital. So if liberal democratic rights are the, is the last word, then what happens to history? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know if, I, if, if, whilst I defend it, I think there must be possibilities to experiment with other ways that might be better. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your extensive answer. We will have time for one question, the last one. So you have a chance in the audience to be the last person who Ask a question this evening. Is this mine or yours? Is it from Afghanistan? Anybody? Well, then I will go back to uh, our esteemed uh, uh, experts in the panel, <laughs> um, our scholars. Do you have anything you would like to add at the end? Well, um... Can you take yeah, the microphone? I'm, I'm just curious about the, the whole issue of, uh, of spirituality and, uh, and the importance of, uh, of a spiritual notion of, uh, on the human for, uh, for the prospect of uh, a non-racial uh, equal world. Or, uh, you don't have to answer it, but uh, I'm just... <laughs> uh, perhaps it's a private issue. So. <laughs> You're curious about the role of spirituality uh, in um, in promoting. Yeah, I mean, if, if you say that uh, humans are um, expressions of the divine, then uh, it is not a material conception of of what of what the human is. So, if we're all reflections of the divine, um, then on a very basic level. Um, okay. we're, we're, we're all oh, yeah. um, connected. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that, that these um, uh, spiritual politics are important. Um, therefore, uh, next to that, I, um, I've been busy with an edited volume that's coming out in May, and Jordi's in the edited volume, and it's with uh, Yvonne van der Pel, where we say, it's not human, but we have to learn to human. We are humaning. For the, the notion of the human might be a notion that, that in a time of, um, of um, uh, 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 climate challenges, we might have to rethink 
human exceptionality. Um, we might have to rethink questions of sovereignty uh, of countries and of, of, of persons tied to that. So I think spirituality was one way of trying to transcend. It was a politics of transcendence, uh, the many kinds of spiritual traditions. Um, and I think to complement that, you need a materialist uh, um, politics of we are humaning with the rest of the expressions of life, and we have to learn to human in a more um, uh, uh, in a more equitable and sustainable way with other expressions of life. So, in that conception, there is no more nature and culture. There's only expressions of life, and one expression of life is the humaning with other expressions of life, and then, uh, so it's a different kind of materialist, and I think both. So if in this book I, I say the Rastafarians have something, in the other book I'm saying, you know, the materialist conceptions of William James, and they have many things to offer to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have come to the end. Uh, I think we're all a bit tired and need uh, a drink. Please give a big round of applause for Frans, your brother, Lupe. You know, John. Amada and Sharek and Alex from Cyprian. And of course, Keisha Smith, who opened the evening. Big applause for yourself as an audience. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't forget to uh, get your cards to order the book. And uh, also, uh, do have a look at the agenda of SPUIF 25, because they have really interesting events coming up. So I thank you again, also the audience at home, and you as an audience. Please, one last big round of applause for everybody. So thank you.